Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Um, as I mentioned, um, I was unable to conduct our Collaborate session uh, this past Wednesday on uh, July 10th, so I wanted to be able to go over the Chapter 8 content that we were scheduled to go over. I was really looking forward to going over this, and maybe next week when we're back all together via Collaborate, I will take some time and touch on some of these topics, because they are important to the overall concept of leadership and how we view leadership and how we view our role as leaders within our teams and within groups at work. So one of the first things I want to touch on um, is our overall organizational structure because structure impacts strategy and it's also important to look at structure from a team standpoint. Um, so factors that determine your overall organizational structure is the environment, the industry that you're in. Um, what is your strategy? So strategy should always drive structure, right? For a long time there was talk, um, I think in organizational development and human resources circles, that we needed flat org charts. Flat org charts would be the panacea that solved all of our organizational problems all of our work dissatisfaction problems, and that's really just not the case. Um, it's really not the way it all comes out and works. Um, strategy drives structure. Um, so if your strategy doesn't necessarily call for a flat org chart, that might not be the right thing to do. Certainly technology impacts that uh, considerably, how that looks overall. And then human resources. What's your human resources strategy? That's going to determine structure, right? Um, what type of people do we need to hire? Do we need a lot of people with maybe a modest skill set, but we need a lot of them? Or do we need a few people maybe with um, a high-level skill set? So that's definitely going to impact our structure and overall look of our organization. As we look at the impact on that, right, um, how decisions are made and related to the execution of our mission, strategy, and goals, um, a functional structure, much like we talk about when we talk about like business-level strategy things, a functional-level structure is going to be based on cost leadership, efficiency, stability, right, where um, a horizontal team or a more self-managed team is going to be based on differentiation, innovation, flexibility. So you can kind of see that continuum from a functional structure to a horizontal team structure. And again, there's not one right way to structure an organization. There's a better way or a better maybe top one or two ways based on the, the mission and strategy that you're trying to execute upon. So definitely the strategy influence on structure, right? Business performance is influenced by structure. Strategic goals should drive the structure. Strategy drives structure, um, and the structure should facilitate the strategic goals. So structure is subservient to strategy. The structure should enhance the execution of your strategic goals and your success in doing so. Functional structures, an organization that has a functional kind of structure. You hear a lot of talk about... Um, uh, you know, things like departments, like an R&D department, engineering department, sales department. When you hear department and it's by function, that's a functional structure, right? And it works. It allows people, right, to be subject matter experts and to really be up on the latest trends, the latest regulations, the latest innovation, perhaps the latest technology uh, within their specific department. The struggle, the risk of the functional strategy is you can get this silo mentality or the silo effect, Right. Um, and much like things operate within a silo, I have the picture up there of silos that I'm looking at right now from the PowerPoint slides. Um, f communication suffers, right? You get a very narrow focus. You're the subject matter expert within the accounting uh, function or the uh, marketing function or the sales function or the operations function, right? But to go talk to someone on another team, you have to go up your chain of command and over and then back down. And sometimes that gets kind of clunky. We've all played the telephone game. Messages get reinterpreted get mixed up, get misunderstood, right? Um, and that's even if someone chooses to share them, right? Um, so communication can be um, a major uh, consequence that suffers um, or a major thing that uh, we, we, we lose within that functional strategy. So it can be one of the things, um, communication can be one of the things that, uh, that really uh, kind of falls short um, as, as you look at a, a functional strategy. The visional structure, so sometimes organizations are structured by division, could be by the type of product they make, could be the, the market that they serve, or could be the geography, a geographic type structure, and we'll talk about some of the pros and cons and how that might look, right? So a functional structure, right, has one president and then all the functions underneath it, where a divisional structure almost has like these mini divisions or mini businesses within the larger organization, and they each have a functional structures that serve their division. So there's an R&D and a finance and a marketing team that might serve electronics division or a consumer products division or a commercial products division, like a pro series. Um, you know, a commercial products division, you know, the, the easiest way to explain this, I think, that a lot of people might understand um, is the difference between 
So if you go buy a riding lawnmower from Home Depot or Lowe's or somewhere, and you're going to cut your lawn at home, even if you've got an anchor or two, right? You probably cut it a, once a week um, and you're done. However, the commercial side of the lawn and garden equipment, the riding lawnmowers, are the people who are like cutting golf courses, the people who like cut the grass at American Family Field, at Lambeau Field, right? Where, where, where that equipment is being used as part of their job and their livelihood. It's not being used to keep their home uh, in order. Uh, product structure, so that's an organizational structure in which each product line or business is handled by a self-contained division, right? Very much allows for focus in one product area, um, allows for expertise at the business level strategy, and it frees corporate managers to do what they should do to take that big picture view of the organization. Geographic structure, um, that's where uh, the company is structured by geography, um, and that's really important, uh, the geographic structure. So a lawn and garden equipment, like I just mentioned, right? So a company like Toro, which makes riding lawnmowers, right? Um, they're going to sell those across the country, right, in probably late winter, early spring. But they're not going to sell snowblowers in the middle of Texas, probably ever, right? And they're certainly not going to be selling or producing a lot of lawnmowers when it starts to become September, October, because they're going to be into their, their winter season equipment, right? Um, so based on geography. So you're going to sell different products in Wisconsin that you might serve sell in Texas versus Arizona, right? Do to cut a lot of grass in Arizona, a lot of desert there, right? Versus what, you know, different parts of the country. So you split it up by geography. Um, food companies, when I worked at Johnsonville, um, the type of sausage we sold, the size of sausage that we sold and the package size, right? In Wisconsin and the Midwest, people like eating sausage on a Sunday afternoon or Saturday afternoon for a college or professional football game, right? That gets served. Other parts of the country wouldn't know what to do with that big stick of summer sausage. They'd be like, how do I serve this? Can someone eat this much, right? Um, it's very different uh, type of situation. So the geographic structure is based on that. The market structure, right, that's the type of customer, right? So you serve a certain type of customer, a uh, way to structure your company. A matrix structure. So in a matrix structure, you might be on, on product X team, but you also might have responsibilities maybe to the engineering team, right? So you're getting priorities shared with you from two different bosses, right? A product team boss and a function boss, right? And sometimes people are put in that, those kind of positions for a professional development or a self-development kind of situation. So we learn how to prioritize, learn how to listen, and ask great questions. In a matrix structure, you need to become really good at helping other people prioritize their work, right? And I worked in a matri matrix structure for a while where I had you know, functional priorities coming in and I had priorities coming from a lot of different areas. And if I would have listened to everybody's, I need this now, right? I never would have gotten anything done, right? Um, I would have, it would have gotten overwhelmed. So when someone did that and said, I need this right now and hurry, hurry, it's an emergency, you know, I would usually sit down and, and say, okay, grab a seat, right? Tell me what you need, tell me what you're trying to accomplish, and then I would kind of help break up their work. Okay, if I get you this by the end of the day, then you're good for a week and then you can move on and then I can get this other person this piece and then they're going to be good for maybe a day and a half, right? And if I get this other person their piece, maybe by the end of tomorrow, they're good for the next month, right? So you have to help other people prioritize their work because... To them, it's an emergency and they needed it yesterday, right? But when you're, you know, only one person maybe serving multiple priorities or multiple streams of input for priorities, you need to help other people prioritize their work. Um, years ago, we used to talk about a virtual network structure. Now, you know, a virtual structure nowadays means much different than it used to be. Um, but a virtual network structure is where all the activities were coordinated through one kind of hub, like a hub and spoke, um, and everything was subcontracted out. It didn't work very well because if you think about it, being all subcontracted out, um, the, the technical expertise was lost. It was lost to the subcontractors and the coordinating organization or team really didn't understand all the latest innovations within, within uh, the industries. Hybrid structure is one that allows for great flexibility. So anything that allows for flexibility and agility becomes really important. So we think about teams, you know, how, how structure can influence strategy and, and what teams. There's a lot of things that we talk about when it comes to teams, right? And one thing I would ask you to think about, right, are what are characteristics of great teams you've been a part of, right? And if I ask that question, a lot of you are going to say communication, trust. Um, we understood each other's strengths and weaknesses, right? We appreciated the value each other bought. Um, those are all good things, right? But the reality is, the reality is that what we call most teams it's a work group or it's a dysfunctional team, right? There's a boss and there's people who report to the boss. And a lot of communication is between the boss and employee, right? And it's one-on-one -on -one from boss to employee. Um, and then when 
um, members of the team don't understand why Joe or Jane or Jill or Jack are doing various things, and maybe they're doing things which are making each other's jobs more difficult because communication is between employee and the boss. There's not a lot of good sharing of shared fate. There's not a lot of good shared consequence there. Um, it gets kind of messy. Um, and, and communication is one thing that, sh that oftentimes suffers in a dysfunctional team or a work group. Um, and the boss, you know, the boss says, hey, I give my employees great direction and they listen to me. And the employees are like, hey, I do what my boss says. But that might be um, at the risk of making it difficult for another team member or another department, right? Um, and, you know, when the employees don't get a raise, they blame their boss. And when the boss can't get results, they blame their employees. There's a lot of back and forth. There's a lot of collusion, dysfunctional behavior. And unfortunately, that is still a reality in a lot of, a lot of what we call teams at work, right? It's a work group, but overall, it's highly dysfunctional. In a functional team, um, now, now folks are sharing, hey, here's what I'm good at. Here's what you're good at. Here's some shared goals. Hey, when you do that, that makes my job easier. Um, when you do this, it makes my job more difficult. Can we talk about that? Um, still a lot of direction given by a boss and overall strategy and, and problem solving comes from the boss down to the team. But at least now the team is having some open discussions as a team about how they can succeed. And then an accountable team, in an accountable team, right, very similar to a functional team, but now the team handles their problems, right? The team doesn't wait for the boss to come down and say, we got a problem, we need to fix this. The team is like, hey, we're coming up short on our goals, or hey, we're having some quality problems. We need to fix this as a team, and then we need to go to our boss and say, hey, here's how we want to solve this. We've identified this as an issue. What do you think? And the boss is more of almost a coach or mentor role and helps the team work through that issue. Um, but the difference is, and the way I like to describe this, between a functional team and an accountable team, and a functional team, the boss still kind of has to play mom or dad and slap all the kids upside the head. Where in an accountable team, the team comes to the boss and says, yeah, we got a problem. Here's what we want to do to fix it. We want your input on it. And that's kind of the understanding of the difference. Um, a functional team has a clear and fully accepted purpose. All teams that want to operate at a high level need that. Um, they have measures that tell them if the purpose is being achieved, so they, they know the score of the game. They have capable processes, competent people, and they have something called shared fate. Right? They're all buying into a set of goals and a set of metrics. Right? And, and, and a functional team is good. It's better than a dysfunctional team or a work group. A functional team is good. And there's a pretty high level of commitment. So we'll take that. That's, that's good. The next level up, when we get in, like this, talk about the self-managed team and a two, true team that's accountable, they deal with those real issues as a team. So if someone's struggling on the team, they deal with it as a team. If they're coming up short on goals, they're dealing with it as a team. If they're celebrating successes, they're celebrating as a team. And then they, you know, uh, go to their boss, go to their coach, go to their supervisor and say, hey, here's what we're dealing with. Here's how we want to handle it, good or bad or, you know, corrective type things. Um, and the thing about accountable teams is they go from having commitment to having some level of investment, right? So we, the team, is always greater than I, right? And we always used to call this big, 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 big we, little me, right? We is always much more important than me as an individual team member, right? I would always make sure my team is successful before my own personal success, so, you know, you wonder where a lot of, like, the five dysfunctions of a team comes from. A lot of the leadership stuff that you hear talked about, a lot of the team and group dynamics, um, comes from somebody, uh, Dr. Wilfred Bion was actually um, a surgeon in the British Army, and he had some background in psychology, and he went on later to study people in groups. And he noticed that when there was one person in a room, people behaved a certain way. You get two people in a room, um, there's a certain dynamic. But you put three or more people in a room, and he noticed some interesting things. And here's what he says, and here's the important takeaway for leadership and organizational development, organizational effectiveness. He said, first of all, we are pack animals, so the theory of the herd. We like to associate with people who are like us, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. That's good. A herd mentality. We're social animals, right? And we're kind of seeing this with a lot of the work from home and the remote work, and certainly, you know, coming out of COVID, we saw that. We don't do well when we're isolated. We need connection with other people. So that herd theory. Individual action is a myth. We carry our groups and associations with us, right? Um, so... The church we belong to, the school we went to, our neighborhood, sports team, where we work, our role on the team at work, all those associations we carry with us, right? And someone asked me a really great question one day. They said, but what about like a real altruistic behavior? Like someone sees a grenade thrown in front of their family and somebody from that family jumps on it and sacrifices their own life to save their, save their family or save their friends or save their team or in the military, save their platoon. Isn't that an individual action? Actually, it's not. It's driven by what they believe their role is to their team, their group, or their family. That they believe, 
right? That they're there to be the, protect, the protector. So it's not individual action. It's how we see our role and our commitment and our responsibilities to our group. And like I said, our group could be our team at work. It could be our friends. It could be our family. And that's what drives that action. Connection to a group is necessary for survival. I just, you know, I just kind of said it with the herd theory. We need connection with other people, right? Dr. Henry Cloud has done some great work in, 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 in workplace psychology and organizational dynamics and group dynamics and organizational psychology. And he always reminds us that there's three things human need, beings need to survive. We need water, right? Nourishment, we need air, so we need to be able to breathe. And we need connection. We need, we, need, we need a connection with other people, right? So we need the nourishment, the sugar, the water kind of stuff. We need air. We need to be able to breathe. And that third component is it's so very vital and crucial. We need connection with other people. If we don't have that connection, um, we, will, we will cease to thrive. In a lot of cases, we'll die. And then the other important piece that Dr. Bean says is we form our self-identity from the groups we belong to, right? So my, my assessment of Jamie's self-worth and my self-identity is created based on the people I hang out with and the relationships and the connection to them, right? It is very important to my self-identity and self-worth. So now if I'm going to do something to change that, if I'm going to threaten that, if I'm going to address conflict or if I'm going to move or if I'm going to change jobs, that's going to shuffle all that around. That's a very unsettling, scary thing to do, right? Um, and, it, and it guides a lot of our behavior and guides a lot of our decisions, sometimes in a very healthy way, but a lot of times what I often say might be a very natural and normal thing, but not a healthy way. So for a team or a group to have, be successful, they must have a clear purpose and shared values, right? If you want to know if your team has clear purpose and shared values, hand each team member a blank sheet of paper and tell them to write down their team's purpose and write down what they think are the top three values in your team. And if you have similar answers, that's great, right? A lot of bosses, managers, coaches don't want to do this with their teams because they're afraid of all the divergent answers they're going to get, that not everyone's on the same page, right? Team must have shared fate, right? In athletics, it's easy. It's a scoreboard. Do you know what the score is at work every day when you come in in the morning and when you leave? Do you know whether you won or lost? When you left work today, do you know whether you won or lost the game? Because right? if you don't know what you did to win, how do you know what to repeat? How do you know what to do over again? If you don't know if you had a bad day at work, if, you, if your team lost lost the game, right? how do you know what to stop doing? Right? Team members understand each other's roles and appreciate strengths and weaknesses. Right? Everybody can't touch the ball all the time. Right? But great team leaders know who to get the ball to, and great team players and teammates know when it's their turn to take the ball. They need to perform. They need to step up. Team had... A team can handle adversity and has a strategy for doing so, right? That might be people coming and going from the team. That might be someone struggling on the team. How do they handle that? They have a healthy, successful way to do that, right? Could be crucial conversations. Could be some other conversation communication technique. Um, could be start, stop, continue for an evaluation, right? All those types of things. And the last piece is members are committed to each other's success. And that comes back to the big we, little me. I would never do anything to sacrifice the success of my team to make myself look better. And that's not only being a great leader, that's being a great teammate, right? Because we've all been on teams with people who they would sacrifice anybody on their team and throw that person under the bus to make themselves look good. That's a team that doesn't have trust and are probably ugly going, ugh, I didn't like being part of that team because that's what happens and that's what goes on. So what drives most individuals when involved in group behavior? It's that connection, those connections and, and that are necessary for our survival and that creator self-identity and self-worth, right? That's why that coworker who arrives late every day, checks the headlines on the internet, grabs a cup of coffee, and doesn't start supporting the team or at their workstation until 20 or 30 minutes into the shift. And we've got customers calling, machines breaking down, right? There's a line at the door, right? Um, we don't say anything, right? Because if we do, they make it mad at us. And if they get mad at us, what happens? Well, then our need to belong, our association, our relationship with Jill or Joe or Jeff or Jane might change, right? And that need to belong is described by you beyond will cause us not to state our true feelings, right? And we don't state our true feelings, so we don't want a separation from those associations, right? We don't want half the team sitting by me at lunch and half the team sitting at Joe at lunch and we're all looking at each other with skulls in our faces, right? Um, half of us are thinking, hey, Joe's been lazy and slacking off for the last six months, right? And the other half is saying, why did Jamie have to say anything? You should have just let it go, right? But not speaking or not speaking or saying something or addressing the real problem is directly opposed to our best interests, right? Because what do people do? It causes division on the team. We start coming in early. We start staying late. We start working harder to make up for Joe, right? Maybe we stay late and have to miss our kid's Little League game or their dance recital. Now our personal life and our family life is suffering. But people do that, right? Well, I can't say anything to Joe. 
I'll just stress myself out. I'll sacrifice my family life. I'll change jobs, change shifts, transfer to a different department. How many times has that happened? Right? And the end result is a very disharmony that we feared. We did everything to protect our relationship with Joel and not create any conflict on the team, but then we end up taking ourselves out of the picture anyway because we transfer a different team, different department, different shift, take a different job. Right? Um, it becomes very, very critical. The other th aspect of fear of separation, which we don't talk about a lot, but it's true and it's real. Um, you know, if you've got a team of five people, right, and all of a sudden, what happens on Friday when Jill is going to be the boss on Monday? So Jill was a peer with her four other coworkers, a team of five. Now all of a sudden on Monday, Jill's the boss, right? So going from peer to supervisor, now you're responsible for the output of that team, right? All the other four teammates on Jill's team, now Jill's not one of the one of the gang, not one of the girls, not one of the guys, right? Not hanging out. Now she's the boss. Now there's some reporting responsibility. She has some responsibility for our collective results, right? What did I just say about those associations that we create, right? Jill was our coworker. She was on the team. We were a teammate with her, right? That was from, from our workplace standpoint, that was important to our identity of who we were as a member of this organization, a member of this team, as a productive member of this organization and company and earning our paycheck, right? So that relationship we have with Jill kind of identified us. Now she's the boss. She's no longer one of us. That rocks that boat, right? And it's very, it's, so when it feels icky and it's a very challenging time, it is. Right? And we need to give people a little bit of space to readjust you know, their relationship with Jill and Jill with the rest of the team. Um, from a leadership standpoint, Jill needs to get there. She has no choice as a leader. She needs to get there and realize her relationship with her four former teammates is going to change a little bit. Right, um, The team needs to get there. If they don't, there needs to be different conversations. But that's why that's always a really tricky time period where someone goes from a peer to being a supervisor of their former peers. Some organizations forbid that. You can't become a manager of people that you run a team with. You have to transfer to a different department or a different division uh, because it's, it's hard. And the reason it's hard is it's tied into this deep core, basic fundamental psychology that our relationship with our coworkers, right, is part of how we create our self-identity and our self-worth, right? And if we can't accept the change to that and continue to be successful, that's going to cause problems. And that causes problems on teams and the group dynamic. Um, that's why that's always an interesting time. Tolerables versus intolerables. New and emerging leaders are great. We're all great at setting the tolerables. Like, here's the bullseye. Here are the three goals we have to hit. But what about the intolerables, right? Organizations and new leaders don't do a good job at saying, hey, here's a line in the sand, right? If you cross this line, you can't be in our team. It is so fundamental to who we are as an organization, as a team. You can't go there. If you cross the line, you go on to the dark side, right? Darth Vader. You go on the other side, and the evil side, and we can't handle that, right? And that could be things like illegal activity, unsafe activity, violating a safety rule or code, right? It's something that's just so out there that if you choose to do this, right, it's not going to be very long until you're either not on a team or not part of the organization, right? That's the intolerables. And, you know, the reason a lot of leaders don't like to set them is because once you set them, you have to enforce them and stand behind them, right? But if you don't set them and you don't enforce them, you start to lose leadership credibility over time, right? That everything's just tolerable. That, that, that can't happen either. And that gets into the dilemma, right? If you tolerate everything, it's just anarchy. Everybody can do what they want and write their own rules. You're going to get nothing. If you tolerate nothing and you overly micromanage, you're going to get nothing, right? However, you'll always get what you tolerate, right? So you got to figure that out. It becomes very important. Very, very important. Um, I shared a few other things. You know, the most influential person in the room will be the one who can state reality without making judgment. Um, so that comes back to the crucial conversations, right? Start with our facts, leave our stories till the end, walk the other person through your facts to the point where they're ready to, they know your story and they're like, I could see why you thought I was acting that way. I might not agree, but I certainly could see why a rational person would believe I was being dismissive, acting arrogant, why I lost my temper, right? There's reasons for conversation, healthy conversation and unhealthy conversation, right? And we talk about when you, when you go to have a conversation with someone or engage, right? The unhealthy reasons, this comes back to the motive, right? To be right, look good, save face, keep the peace, win, punish, avoid conflict, or blame. If that's why we're going to have a conversation with someone, we're going to tell them why we're right and they're wrong, we're going to blame them, we're going to punish them. They screwed up, and 100 out of 100 people believe they were wrong. Now, we're going to we're gonna make sure they know that we took a poll and all 100 people think that they're wrong, right? And then we wonder why that conversation goes bad, right? comes back to that motive versus content. If our motive can be to learn, find the truth, produce results and strengthen relationships, right? If we, our motive for a conversation is one or a combination of all four of those, right? 
we are much more likely to have a healthy dialogue with other people, to maintain safety, the kind of things I talked about last week, right? Um, doesn't mean we don't doesn't mean we don't talk the truth, doesn't mean sometimes it's not brutal, brutally honest, but we need we need to come out and say it, right? All right. Um, the five dysfunctions of a team by Patrick Lencioni, right? It's very important for team behavior and it ties into what Dr. Bian said. This is this addresses all that stuff I just talked about with him, right? You have to have trust on a team. Teams that don't have trust, they hide mistakes, they never admit mistakes, right? Because if I don't trust you and I admit a mistake, right, you're gonna take advantage of that and you're gonna highlight my mistake to make yourself look better. All you're doing is tearing me down. You're not making yourself any better, you're just tearing me down. Right? Fear of conflict. Why can't we all just get along? Just go along to get along. Just be quiet and shut up and take take it, right? That's not healthy. Lack of commitment, right? We don't want any goals. We don't want any metrics. We don't want to actually measure anything, right? It's just all good, right? Avoidance of accountability, right? There's no standards, low standards. And then the inattention to results, right? All of our marketing data might be telling us we're not going to launch this new product, but because I'm the president of the company and it's my pet project, we're going to do it anyway, right? And we're going to lose millions of dollars. Um, Doing do ordering someone to do something just because you can because of your organizational authority, even though all the numbers say something else, is a number one way to destroy trust, credibility, and destroy the culture in your organization. So something I always share with people, especially about leadership, and this goes back to that internal locus of control. Things in life do not happen to you; they happen because of you, right? Now, do bad things happen to good people? Absolutely, right? None of us is born with 100% guarantee of happiness. We're all going to struggle, right? Um, a basketball coach that always used to say this, you know, you need, you, need, you need to learn how to handle hard better, right? It never gets easier, right? What we learn how to do is we learn how to deal with the difficult times, right? And we get better at dealing with the difficult times, right? Uh, so things in life do not happen to you. They happen because of you. So a lot of the things in your life, you know, ask yourself, like, when things are going good, okay, what did I do? What decisions did I make? Who did I surround myself with? What are the values I was embracing? How was I leading myself well to get to this point, right? And how can I repeat those, right? And then maybe when things aren't going so well, you might say, okay, well, what part of this do I own, right? What decisions did I make? What decisions did I put off? Did I not surround myself with the right people? Did I not listen to other people's advice, right? Um, so that's just a good thing to remind ourselves about, right? Things in life do not happen to you. They happen because of you. And and, and the second piece of that, which I really, um, you know, caught on to a couple, a couple years ago, I, it was a basketball coach, a, a NCAA women's basketball coach. She shared the message. She said, life never gets easy. We just get better at handling the hard. We get better at handling hard, right? So handle hard better. And she said, we get better at doing that. And that's when we really truly start to lead ourselves in a meaningful way. So just a few thoughts around leadership, around leadership, around teams, right? Influencing others, um, you know, the Dr. Beyond stuff, right? Uh, the relationships we have and the associations and the people that we choose to hang out with, um, they, they reaffirm our self-worth and create our self-identity. So if we have to do something to break those associations, to challenge those relationships, that's scary. And even if it's our best interest to challenge those relationships and put some of those relationships at risk, we may not do it because we just fear that separation from that group, from that self-identity, from the things that create our self-worth. But if we truly want to be leaders, sometimes we have to handle the hard better and step up to those really, we have to have the courage to step up to those situations and at times risk a relationship that we may value more than someone else does. And we need to be okay with stepping up to that. So with that, hopefully I gave you some insights on some things. I'm going to touch on a little this next week and we're all back together via Collaborate again. I apologize for not being able to join you on this past Wednesday had an oops, it was kind of an ironic oops and a comedy of errors that ended up where I was disconnected from technology. We got that all solved uh, later in the evening, but um, hopefully you're all doing well. Have a great week. Reach out with any questions and I will see you back next week. So thank you so much.